All right, is everybody ready? Oh, I guess, okay, I'm going for it. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to each of you. We're gonna begin the webinar in just a moment. You are participating in the North 148th Street non-motorized bridge webinar this afternoon. We expect the webinar to be a total of about one hour, including some time to ask questions towards the end. My name is Kristen Anderson, and I'm part of the communications and outreach team. A question should have just popped up on your screen. We'd love to hear where you're participating from. Please let us know by answering the question. Before we get started, we wanted to cover a few tips on how to participate in the webinar. You are all muted, which we've done to reduce background noise and improve everyone's experience. We won't have participants using audio today. To hear the presentation, you can adjust your volume by clicking on the microphone on the bottom left. Please use the chat button on the toolbar if you have questions about connecting to the webinar or accessing the closed captions. For those of you using closed captions, if the captions stop for any reason, please look to the chat box where our team will put an alternative link for you to use to access those captions. Our support team will provide you with assistance via the chat box. To ask questions about the presentation or contribute comments, click on the Q&A window in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. This is different from the chat box. We request that you use the Q&A box to make sure we can get a chance to read your questions out loud. You can submit questions at any time during the webinar and we'll answer as many as we can towards the end. Please try to use complete sentences so that when we read your question out loud, uh, it, it can be clearly understood. If we don't have time to answer all the questions today, the questions, those questions will be answered in a post summary webinar report. A recording of the webinar and question and answer session will be posted on the project webpage sometime next week. So it looks like we have quite a few folks from both the Parkwood and the Ridgecrest neighborhoods participating and a few from Meridian Park and Highland Terrace and then some other shoreline neighborhoods. We also have a folks joining us from Seattle and Edmonds. Thanks everyone. Finally, uh, before we get started, I, we just wanted to mention that all of us who are per, uh, participating today are practicing social distancing and we're conducting this webinar from remote locations, so please excuse any background noise. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Uh, my name is Lee Bonebrake. I am the project manager uh, from the city for this project. And today we're gonna have uh, presenters. Uh, you've already met Kristen Anderson. She's our outreach project manager, but we also have uh, Trisha Yonke, who's the city's project, or, excuse me, the city engineer. And Aaron Olson, who is the design project manager from our design team, KPFF. Uh, we are, this is the first time that we're doing this kind of an open house in this format. So appreciate you joining the journey with us and uh, we're all learning together. On the next slides, we have the uh, presentation outline. Uh, we're gonna begin with a project overview, give a brief background of the history of the project and uh, cover the goals, what we're actually trying to accomplish with the project and why. Then we'll run quickly through uh, all of the project elements. Uh, our design team has identified the most feasible options uh, for us to construct. Um, and then we'll discuss each of the elements of the alternatives including the pros and cons. Then we'll briefly discuss our current timeline for design and construction. And finally, we'll finish up with an opportunity for real-time question and answer with members of the city and the design team. Uh, for now, I'm gonna transition over to Trish and she's gonna run you through the project overview. Thanks, Lee. Uh, I'm going to start here with making sure everybody's uh, oriented as to where this project is located. Uh, there's a map up on your screen that shows where the project location is. Uh, and it, you can see it's, it basically is as if 148th connected from the west side of I-5 to the east side of I-5. 
uh, where currently now I-5 interrupts that. Um, and if to provide you with a good landmark, most of you are probably familiar with, as you're driving down I-5, the cell tower that's located on the west side of I-5, adjacent to a couple of churches, that's very close to where the bridge would come down on the west side. Uh, and then on the east side, it lands within the very active construction zone right now for sound transit. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, the real interest and need for this project started back in 2016 when the city adopted the 148th subarea plan. The plan changed the zoning in the area to increase density near the light rail stations on both sides of, of I-5. But I-5 creates a big barrier to connecting the two sides and to providing access to the light rail station from the west side of the freeway. And so in 2017, the city conducted a feasibility study to install a non-motorized bridge across I-5 at this some location uh, north of 145th. Now the, the feasibility study looked at several locations which are shown on the map on your screen. Uh, you can see that there were three locations that were down around 147th Street there was this location at 148th Street, which is circled with the uh, red circle, and then a location also up close to 149th Street. Uh, in looking at these locations, they, fact, they determined that 148th was the preferred location. Uh, and a couple of factors that really contributed to that location included uh, really trying to meet some limitations in clearance over I-5 and also clearance under the new light rail. Uh, really created some uh, pinch points. And then another key element in considering the preferred option was increasing the walk shed or actually the area for people that would be willing to use uh, this bridge in order to get to the light rail station to encourage more people to uh, walk to the light rail rather than feeling the need to drive. And so that's how we got to this project we're at today. And so moving on to the next slide, in 2019, we started the design on this and we had a few key project goals that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, we're trying to support the 145th station as a transportation hub, connecting people with the light rail, but also bus rapid transit and a trail along the rail for non-motorized users. We're, we want to improve safety and travel times for bikes and pets trying to get to the station. As I mentioned before, we're increasing the walk shed or the number of people that feel comfortable walking to the station. Uh, and this also provides the opportunity to reconnect or better connect neighborhoods on both sides of I-5. And then ultimately this bridge will, so will connect to an off corridor bike network between the inner urban trail, the trail along the rail, and ultimately the Burke Gilman Trail. Um, moving on to the next slide. And as we look at these options, there's some key evaluation criteria that we're using uh, well we make, to make a preferred uh, ultra, to identify a preferred alternative. We wanna look at user safety and security, uh, the travel times to get people from the west side to the light rail station or back the other direction as well. Project costs, which include the initial construction costs and the long-term operation and maintenance costs. Aesthetics, uh, ease of stakeholder approval. We have a lot of stakeholders in this area, both property owners and Sound Transit and WashDOT, and we wanna make sure we can have a successful project by coordinating with these stakeholders. And then also the requirements and the costs associated with purchasing right away for this project. And then a portion of it is also public feedback and your input for both through the question and answers of this webinar, but also participation in the online open house and the location of that online open house is at the bottom of the screen. In June, we will be going to council with a, uh, to get a preferred alternative uh, based upon these design considerations and the public feedback. And with that, I will turn it back to Lee. Thank you, Trish. So now we'll move on to the project elements. These are a result of a study that we've asked our design team to go through to determine feasible alternatives and, and then uh, narrow it down to the most feasible of the group. Um, and these, as you can see from the map, 
it's really three distinct elements that go into this one project. We have the West Trail connection, which connects from the West Bridge Landing to First Avenue. Uh, then we have the bridge structure itself in the middle, the crossing over I-5. And then on the east side, we have the East Bridge Landing and how you get from the bridge down to the light rail station and connect to the trail along the rail. These are all relatively high level concepts uh, that will be refined further in design. And um, all of the information that we collect, the feedback from you guys as part of this process will be presented along with these elements and a recommendation from the design team to city council uh, for selection of a preferred alternative. And that's gonna happen early June. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Aaron to run you through each of the design elements. <clears throat> Thanks, Lee. Um, as Lee mentioned, this project can be divided into three distinct sections, the West Trail connection, the bridge structure, and the East Bridge landing. Um, any of these options from either of these three sections can be combined with one another to form a complete project. I'll be going through these options starting with the West Trail connection, and we'll be working my way east with the bridge structure options next, followed by the East Bridge landing options. For the West Trail connection, the design team in the city evaluated possible ways to connect First Avenue Northeast to the West Bridge Landing via a trail, including options to the north and to the south of North 148th Street. Through evaluation of feedback from stakeholders and other limiting factors, two feasible options have been identified. These are option one, the minimal build out, and option two, the full build out. I'll go through both of these in detail. Okay, this is option one, the minimal build out. Uh, just to orient everyone to the screen here, we have First Avenue Northeast running north south on the left hand side of the screen, and then I 5 also running north south on the right hand side of the screen. In blue and in red, we're showing a connection to the bridge as well as the pedestrian bridge itself. Um, element A shows potential future improvements to First Avenue Northeast, which could include. Uh, bike lanes and sidewalk improvements. And while these may not be built as part of this project, it's important to consider those improvements for the design of the trail to make sure that they all tie in correctly. In this option, um, element B shows a bicycle route that connects First Avenue to the bridge connection. And this is a shared, uh, a, uh, the bicycles will share the drive aisle of the existing parking lot of the th two churches to the south there to make their connection. Additionally, um, element C is shows the trail itself. This would be an eight foot wide sidewalk for pedestrians only. Um, pedestrian lighting would be provided with, for safety. And then element D shows uh, that parking for all, th all three church lots would be maintained with this option. Here's a different view of option one, minimal build out. Um, here we're at ground level and we're looking west towards First Avenue Northeast. Um, on the left would be the Unitarian and Philippi church lots. And then on the right would be the Church of Christ lot. Here you can see the pedestrian only trail uh, sidewalk on the right hand side of the screen. And then again, bicyclists would share the drive aisle of the parking lot. <clears throat> Option two is what we're calling the full build out. Again, element A are potential future improvements to First Avenue, which may not be a part of this project, but that the trail will need to consider in order to properly tie into it. Here, elements B and C are a combined multi-use path that's 16 feet wide, which allows both pedestrians and bicyclists to share the same trail to make their connection from First Avenue Northeast uh, to the bridge itself. Um, this includes a landscape buffer as well as pedestrian lighting for safety. Um, and because this option does provide a wider trail, um, it may impact parking on either of the three parcels and the city uh, on either of the three church lots. And the city is looking at ways of mitigating that parking loss, including relocating those spots um, to other locations on this side. <clears throat> Here's a different view of option two. Again, we're looking west towards North Avenue, First Avenue Northeast um, at ground level. Uh, Philippi and Unitarian churches would be on the left and the Church of Christ would be on the right. Here you can see the wider 16 foot wide trail 
um, that's a shared use path for both pedestrians and bicyclists. Okay, now we'll move on to the three bridge options. A um, couple things to note about all three bridges. Um, the pathway on the bridge will be 16 feet wide and will be a shared use trail for both pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, all bridges will have safety features, including pedestrian railing, lighting, and throw barriers for the safety of bridge users and for drivers on I-5 below. Um, all, all of these options are built off-site and dropped into place in order to minimize impact to I-5. And all of these options will cross the freeway without placing a support or column in the median between northbound and southbound I-5. Okay, here's a view of option one, which we're calling the combined arch. Here we're on at I-5 level looking north. You can see the bridge in the center of the screen there and the light rail station on the right hand side of the screen. Um, the bridge crosses over I-5 providing all necessary clearances to the freeway below and then passes below the light rail structure uh, on the right hand side of the screen. This is one of the key challenges of the project to provide the necessary clearance to the freeway and then uh, allow the trail to pass underneath the light rail structure. Um, for the combined arch, this arch consists of uh, two pipes um, that support the bridge below with vertical cables. You can also see certain elements like the pedestrian throw barrier, or sorry, the throw barrier and pedestrian rail um, on this view. Um, here's a different view of, of option one, the combined arch. Now we're standing on the bridge and we're looking toward the east. You can see the light rail station on the right hand side of the screen and then the bridge uh, on the left hand side of the screen. You see the two pipe arches along with the vertical elements that support the bridge. Um, also shown in this view are elements like the pedestrian rail and the throw barrier on the bridge. Option two is, is pretty similar to option one, um, the slightly different configuration. This is called a tight arch bridge. Again, we're, we're standing at I, on I-5 looking north uh, with the station on the right. Um, there would be two pipe arches that support the bridge with vert diagonal cables as shown. Um, and you'll also see the pedestrian rail and throw barrier similar to the other option. Again, we're standing on the bridge now looking toward the east. You can see the two pipe that support the, the two pipe arches that support the bridge with some diagonal cables, as well as a throw barrier and pedestrian rail, um, similar to the other option. And then the final option is a truss bridge. And these are pretty commonly used as pedestrian bridges. And you may have seen these in your area. Uh, it's qu not quite as tall as the two arch bridges, but still provides a crossing of I-5 and then passes underneath the light rail station on the right. <clears throat> Here we are again, standing on the bridge looking towards the east. Again, the truss is um, slightly shorter than the two arch bridges, but um, still has all the same similar characteristics in terms of uh, throw barrier and railing um, provided for safety. And then finally, we'll like to discuss some of the options we considered for the East Bridge landing. Um, a few things, uh, all of these landing options provide a connection from the pedestrian bridge to the following elements. Um, to Shoreline South, 145th Street Station, light rail station, um, to the trail along the rail, which is also being built as part of the light rail project and that's a trail that runs parallel to the light rail tracks um, and connects to the north to 151st and then a connection to the existing cul-de-sac at, uh, at 149th street. The first option uh, we're calling the A-frame ramp and I'll just orient everyone again to the figure on the screen. Um, we have I-5 running north-south on the left hand side the light rail station is shown in the bottom right corner. And then you can see Northeast 149th in the top right. Um, the light rail tracks also run north south on this screen and are shown as a black and white dotted line. And the trail along the rail would also run north south and run parallel to the light rail tracks. In this option, pedestrian and bicycle users would cross the freeway on the bridge and they'd reach here 
um, element A, which is a ramp. Um, it's an angular shaped ramp with a somewhat steeper slope to connect down into the light rail station with an average grade of approximately six and a half percent. Um, element B shows a set of stairs that people could also choose to make their connections to the station and or Northeast 149th or the trail along the rail. And then as I mentioned, Sound Transit light rail tracks will run above the ramp and the stairs at this location. And at its low lowest point, the clearance between the bridge and the overhead light rail tracks is approximately eight feet. In this option, uh, pedestrian and bicycle users would cross the bridge and then proceed down what we're calling a switchback ramp. With this particular style of ramp, it allows for a more gradual grade of approximately 4% down to the station. Um, again, element B shows uh, stairs that could also be used to make connections to the station or to 149th Street cul-de-sac or the trail along the rail to the north. Um, with this option, uh, with the light rail tracks passing above both the ramp and the, and the trail, uh, the lowest point, the clearance between the, the bridge and the light rail tracks uh, is slightly over nine feet. And then finally, option three is what we're calling the direct ramp. Here, pedestrian users would, pedestrian and bicycle users would cross the freeway on the bridge, and then they'd reach element A, which is a ramp um, where you could choose to make a right or head south to make your connection down a ramp to the light rail station, or make a left and or head north to make your connection to Northeast 149th or the um, trail along the rail. In this option, the, again, the light rail tracks run above the, the ramp, and at its lowest point, the clearance between the bridge and the light rail tracks is between eight and a half and nine feet. And then I will turn this back over to Lee so he can discuss schedule. Thank you, Aaron. So here's a look at the current schedule. Uh, we're currently in the type size and location phase, which is all up where we've asked the design team to come up with all the feasible options. Uh, those are the design elements that we just ran through. They compiled those into a report called the type size and location report. Uh, and that information currently being presented in the online open house and here in the presentation as well. We collect all of that feedback and present all of that information to city council along with a recommendation from a design team. They collect the, they select a preferred alternative and we come back to you, the public, with another open house presenting what was selected along with a little bit further design uh, refinement with that selection. And then by the end of the year, we'll be at the 30% design phase. Beyond that, schedule gets a little bit more high level. Uh, early 2021 will be 60% design. Then we'll work through all of our required environmental documentation uh, onto 90% design and working through any right of way um, needs that the project is going to require and final design by the end of 2021 and then early 2022 will go out to bid and ultimately construction with the goal of being complete in early 2023. Did also want to mention quickly we do because the all of the development that's going on in the 145th area around the station. We, the city has set up a website that compiles all of the city projects in one location for easy access. Uh, there are currently eight projects of which this project is one of them. We have 145th corridor, 145th interchange with I-5. Uh, there's going to be new sidewalks going in on 1st Avenue. Um, 5th Avenue is going to have some rechannelization, which is restriping of the roadway. There's the off-quarter bike network. Uh, some bus rapid transit lines going in, and then, of course, the trail along the rail that's going to roughly follow the, the light rail uh, alignment. Um, for more information, feel free to, we invite you to visit the, the website, which is at the shorelinewa.gov backslash destination 2024. You can take a look uh, at all of these projects a little bit further in depth. And finally, we're at the Q&A portion of the presentation. Um, and in addition to the presenters, we also have panelists. Uh, we have uh, Natasha Walters, who is the city's transportation services manager. 
and Juniper Nami, who's the city's light rail project manager. Uh, they are, in addition to the design team, they will be able to help answer some of the questions that you guys might have. And I'm going to transition over to Kristen to help facilitate the questions. Thanks, Lee. Um, we've already received quite a few questions. Uh, as a reminder, submit your questions using the Q&A window at the bottom of the screen, and uh, we'll do our best to respond to as many questions as possible in the next 30 minutes. So let's get started. Um, there are a lot of people asking whether individuals would be able to climb up onto the bridge easily and commit vandalism. Okay, Aaron, I think I'm gonna have you respond to this question. Sure. Um, yeah, that will be a definite consideration during design. Um, we'll uh, have to consider uh, nuisance climbing hazards to make sure that people are not easily able to uh, climb on the bridge out over the freeway or, or, or vandalize the bridge in any way. Um, but that's always at the forefront of our mind when we design structures like these, especially pedestrian bridge structures. <laughs> All right, thanks, Aaron. There have also been a few questions about um, uh, ADA accessibility and whether the bridge will be compliant. I can answer that one, and Aaron, feel free to jump in uh, after I uh, answer to supplement. But uh, all of our design will be ADA compliant. Uh, we're going to be following all of the requirements of. Wash dot sound transit, um, all of the ADA requirements, city codes, and whatnot. Um, but uh, Aaron, do you have any other thing, anything to add? Um, yeah, not much to add. ADA is a very important consideration when designing pedestrian and bicycle bridges, and is always at the forefront of the design team's mind. And this, um, all elements of this project will be ADA compliant. Great, thank you. Um, are you able to speak at all, along with the uh, ADA compliance, there were some questions about how steep the connections will be on each side. Is there anything you can add? I will, I'll let Aaron um, answer this one as well. Um, yep, as I mentioned previously, um, we will need to be ADA compliant for all components of this project and there are several ways that you can do that um, within the ADA guidelines. Um, oftentimes a, a continuous ramp will need to be below 5% grade. Um, if you need to go steeper, you can, but you need to provide level landings at regular intervals. And so um, the design team will consider the use of continuous less steep ramps or more steep ramps with uh, level breaks to um, make sure that it works uh, geometrically, but uh, in either case, we will follow all guidelines for, for ramp grades and steepness. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There have also been a few questions about the cost comparison between the three bridge options. Yeah, um, so in general, the the cost range uh, for total project cost for each of those with escalation is roughly $23 million to $30 million um, because of the different combinations that you can have with the, with the different approaches on the west side and then the bri different bridges and then the different approaches on the east side. Um, there are several different options. I believe the combinations are, what is it, roughly 27 different combinations that you can have. Um, so the range is 23 million to 30 million. And if you go right in the middle, which would be suppose full build out option on the west side with a tight arch bridge and then um, option C on the east side, that ends up being roughly about $24 million total cost for that option. Um, but it, it really varies. Um, it will provide some more detail when we post the question and answers on the website after the project or after the presentation, that'll be early next week, we can provide that information. Um, but Aaron, did you, if you have anything you wanna to add to that, feel free. 
Um, yeah, as you mentioned, Lee, there's a, a number of combinations that you could uh, pick to select a full project here. Um, with regards to just the bridges themselves, they're all fairly similar in cost um, in that they're all very long span bridges in order to cross the freeway um, and all have construction challenges associated with building over the freeway. So the bridge costs are very similar, um, but they do have differing costs in operations and maintenance. Um, in general, the truss is a little bit more expensive to maintain over time because there are more members to, uh, to maintain. Um, but in general, all three bridges are, are, are fairly comparable in construction costs. Okay, thanks. This one is sort of a two-part question about the West Trail connection, um, the minimal build out with bikes using the drive aisle in the church parking lot. And uh, there's some people uh, expressing concern about that. And then there's a specific question that asks if the project selected the bicycles, the option for the bicycles to go through the church parking lot, uh, is the church liable for any type of collision that would occur? Great question. Um, Trish, you want to take that one? Sure, Lee. And I agree. This is a great question and a question that we will need to dig into more as we try and figure out uh, right away uh, property acquisitions. We certainly, our intention is not to push this liability onto the church. And that will be part of the discussions we have with the property owners uh, at coming up with a final solution. Okay, thanks. Um, how will this project be paid for? Okay, well, we currently have $10 million in funding secured, uh, federal highway grants. We have some sound transit money and some um, county uh, dollars currently procured for this project. We do have a funding gap. Uh, for that, I'm going to transition over to Natasha to discuss some of our funding pursuits for that. Thanks, Lee. Yes, um, we're very happy to have secured both federal and, and regional funds that um, Lee just mentioned. And we're in good standing. I think also Lee to mention that we're fully funded through design and right of way. We'll be pursuing additional grant funds. Um, we have options to pursue additional federal grant funds. We'll also be working with our state legislature, which we have been doing um, over the last couple of years. So we'll, we're, we're looking forward to um, making a potentially a request next year. Um, and then there's additional regional funds that we're pursuing. So regional, uh, state and uh, state legislature, federal funds are all um, in process. Thank you. It looks like we have uh, some questions about parking, particularly on the west side. Uh, one specific question is about asking how the city or the churches will stop the public from using the church parking lots for unofficial park and rides. So uh, that's a great question as well. Uh, and I know that's one that's on top of minds, um, particularly on the, on the west side. The city, realizes that there are going to be potential parking impacts for this project um, and we are anticipating looking into ways to mitigate some of those parking. Um, I'm going to uh, also invite Natasha to jump in as well to discuss a little bit further on the transportation side. Sure, I think we'll be working with the churches in terms of ensuring that there's uh, not parking issues. Lee, Lee I'm, I'm confirming this with you, but we will be working with the churches in terms of impacts for parking um, potentially in their lots, um, if there's potential conflicts. In terms of this, is it, do you want to say anything else about that, Lee, and then I'll talk about city streets? Um, yeah, I think that's just something that we're going to be working through as we get further into design. We, we fully understand that that's going to probably be an issue, and that's definitely a concern for all of the churches. Um, and I think there are things that we can we can do to help to mitigate that. But that's that's a discussion that we get into a little bit more in depth when, once we get into design a little bit more. Thanks, Lee. And then I would add, in terms of on city streets, we're aware that with Sound Transit's Linwood Link light rail station opening, that there will probably be um, potentially an interest in parking in the neighborhood. Um, we're in the middle of doing a three-year parking study. 
we're looking at additional use of our residential parking zones that we have, for example, around Shoreline Community College. So we're actively looking at um, ways of ensuring that um, there's um, a, a recognition of the need for residential um, property owners, um, people in the neighborhood to be able to still park and the, the residential parking zone helps with that. And we'll also be monitoring after opening of light rail um, with Sound Transit to look at any potential parking impacts and if we need to do additional enforcement or um, program modifications for parking issues. Okay, thank you. Um, staying on the west side, uh, there are some additional questions about, one for example is, how would the bicycle route be made known to bicyclists in option one, the minimal build out? Okay, in that one we have um, painted markings on the, on the bicycle path itself called Sharrows, I'm sure you've seen them. Um, and then there would just be pavement markings to, and then Aaron, is there gonna be anything else other than that uh, plan for future design? <clears throat> uh, yeah, primary uh, way to point it out would be pavement markings, but also uh, signage and wayfinding would be used to help um, make sure that bicyclists uh, take the correct path there. Okay, thank you. Uh, hopping over to uh, the bridge structure, someone was asking, do, do the bridge structures differ by aesthetics and constructability only? Um, how else, how does the cost vary among them? Aaron, why don't you go ahead and answer this one, please? Sure. Um, <clears throat> Yes, yeah, so the bridges definitely vary in their look and their feel, as you saw from those graphics. Um, as I mentioned, the costs for all three bridges are relatively similar, uh, with only slight variation between the three. Um, and then as far as how all three are built, um, one of the biggest uh, challenges of this project is constructing on and over, or on and over um, I-5. And so um, obviously, you can't just shut down I-5 for uh, a couple of weeks while you're building a bridge. So all of these are intended to be constructed off-site and then placed and dropped in place in, uh, in one short duration uh, amount of time. Uh-oh. I'm wondering if we were experiencing some Oh, no, nope, there we go. Yep. Thank you. Sorry about, there you go. Classic, not unmuting yourself. I think we're all getting used to this. Uh, at North 147th, the pedestrian bridge could connect directly to the existing street with no disruption to property owners and no need to expand, expend funds to purchase rights from property owners. Can you please clarify what factor makes this choice impossible? Sure. Uh, the bridge landing on the west side is completely surrounded by private right of way. We could, well, there's many different ways that we could connect to First Avenue, but all of them involve uh, impacting somebody privately. Um, Aaron, you care to go into greater depth for the analysis that we went into? Yeah. Um, in addition to those property impacts, um, a crossing at 147. Um, isn't feasible because the light rail um, structure is starting to uh, head down and make, meet grade at 147. So in other words, the light rail is starting to um, descend as it heads north and you physically cannot fit a bridge uh, underneath the light rail at that location um, while providing proper clearance to I-5 below. And that, that was confirmed in the feasibility study and by the design team at this time. Um, so the a connection at 147th was not deemed uh, feasible. This is Trish, if I could add in one other thing as well. Uh, sticking within the current align alignment at 148th, we did look at an entrance from 147th uh, heading north to where we're showing the bridge landing there near 148th, but closer to I-5. 
uh, we had concerns and did not move that one forward because of the length of that path and some concerns for security by having that long of a path kind of running behind and adjacent to I-5 uh, with less visibility and some concerns from the adjacent property owners that people would be more tempted to just make that straight connection to 148 than taking the ramp down or the roadway, the connection down to 147. So we've tried to consider several of those options and ultimately landed on these, uh, all these west side landings that do come out towards uh, 148. Thank you. So we just wanted to acknowledge we realize the screen has gone black and uh, we're troubleshooting on the back end, but we'd like to continue the Q&A while we can and know that we are working on that issue. So we have some questions about security uh, and on the trail and on the bridge and specifically if there will be security cameras. So that is a question that we've received a few times and we don't have a concrete answer for that. Certainly security cameras are an, an option, but we still need to look into whether or not that makes sense for what we're doing. Um, I know there are other security measures that we can take. Aaron, uh, care to elaborate on that one? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the big security features will be appropriate lighting. Uh, to make sure that the trail and the bridge and the landings are all uh, well lit and that everyone feels safe using them at nighttime. Additionally, um, making sure that the trail feels wide and open and accessible and that people feel safe using it is another form of security. Um, and then it should also be mentioned that um, Sound Transit does have 20 uh, security present at their station. And while they may not be patrolling, the area, they will have access to the East Landing and to the bridge to respond to the incident. Okay, thanks. There's a question uh, from someone wondering if any funding delays for this project related to COVID-19 might occur. That, so as of right now, we don't, have any known impacts uh, to our current funding sources uh, due to the COVID-19 process or um, event. Um, at, at, so as far as we know, as of right now, we're not going to be affected. Um, and, but as you know, things are changing rapidly day by day. So I, the possibility is always there. Uh, but as of right now, everything is moving forward as is. Uh, we have a question about First Avenue Northeast. Does First Avenue Northeast currently have bike lanes both north and south on 145th? Or First north and south of 145th, excuse me. First Avenue does not currently have bike lanes, uh, but the future build out will, that's, that's in the plan uh, for when we install sidewalks along First Avenue, it's gonna include uh, installation of bike lanes um, and sidewalks um, improvements along First Avenue. So some rechannelization is going to occur on First Avenue to accommodate. Great. Thank you. Someone here is asking, is the only way to give feedback at the open house or in the online open house? So the online open house is a great way to give feedback. Um, these questions are also being tracked and collected. Um, but if you have any questions that, that you think of after this, uh, feel free to email me directly. My inf contact information is on the online open house, or you can also visit the project website to get to my contact information. If there's any questions that you have or anything else that you feel like you weren't able to say during this process, feel free to email me directly. All right, moving over to the east side, the clearance between the bridge and light rail at eight or nine feet seems too tight. Is there any way to increase that? Aaron, would you like to speak to that? <clears throat> I'm sure. Yeah, it is, it is quite, um, quite tight in that area. Um, while we're still above the absolute minimum required of eight feet, um, the desired is typically to have 10 feet or more. Um, 
unfortunately, it's not particularly feasible to increase that uh, because we need to get over the freeway, which is an absolute must. They, ha they have minimum required clearances to the freeway. And so that really creates a, a pinch point in which we can get down below the light rail structure while maintaining those ADA grades that I was talking about. So we, we looked at this quite a bit in this design phase and found that um, the best we could get is a little bit over nine feet. Um, and then option one showed that we had approximately eight feet, which was the absolute minimum. All right, thank you. Who makes the decision about which option to use and how are you collecting and using input from the public? Great question. Um, so all of the information we're gathering from the online open house, from the presentation, we've also been having uh, meetings with community groups. We've met, been meeting with the, the churches. Um, all of that information we're gathering and it's been helped to inform some of the design, preliminary design that we're, we're presenting, presenting to you today. And in addition to that, um, it, when we present this information to city council, along with the recommendations from the design team. Um, Trish mentioned the evaluation criteria that we have for uh, on the design side. Um, all of that information is gonna be formulated into a recommendation from uh, city staff uh, that we would recommend to city council and city council will ultimately make the final decision as to which alternatives we move and we advance to 30% design. Thank you. Another question, is this project scheduled to be open by the same time as the Sound Transit Link Station? So we are shooting to be open before that goes live. We have a, a window um, that we need to get constructed before the, the tracks are live. Otherwise, it becomes more difficult to do. I'm not saying that it, it, it can't be done, but it will become more difficult. So we're shooting to, to be um, at least constructed on the, the east side before the light rail tracks go live. We have a few logistical challenges that we're trying to work through, but that's the current goal, uh, 2023. And I believe, um, Juniper, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe 2024 is the, uh, the goal for Sound Transit opening. Correct. The um, scheduled, the board adopted uh, start of service date is July 17th of 2024. Yeah, so our, our goal is to be early to mid 2023 to be completed with the bridge project. So Lee, there have been a few questions uh, wondering why the West Trail connection was placed where it's placed and if you considered access to the north of the Iglesia Church or to the south of the Unitarian and Philippi churches. Sure. We did look at alternative um, alignments that ran to the north um, and then also alignments that ran to the south. One of the challenges that we had going to the north is we have um, uh, Thornton Creek up there and so we have some environmental um, challenges with, with going that way um, and then coming down to the south there were um, Trish alluded to it some other challenges with length of travel and then would people actually end up going straight through the church properties anyway when we met with all three of the church the leaderships from all three of the churches they all expressed that concern um, as well, but we yes, we have looked at alignments going to the north and to the south and for a number of reasons um, We have uh, those alternative alignments have been eliminated for um, a number of different reasons and so the, the the two that we're showing here today appear to be the most feasible of all of the options that we've looked at Thank you Here's another question. There are some very large evergreen trees on the proposed path on the west side. What happens to those trees? So once we get beyond this design phase, whatever alternatives we end up selecting, 
the alignments are not 100% set. There will be, that's part of, gonna be part of the next design phase is doing, having some refinement for uh, where the exact trail alignment will go and looking for opportunities to save some of those trees. If we do remove trees, we'll be following the, uh, the city code for tree removal and replacement, which is generally variable depending on the size of the tree. Um, the larger the tree, the more trees you, uh, you replace it with. So up to three, so potentially a lot of those trees, depending on the diameter of the trunk, uh, could be, re if they are removed, they'll be replaced at a three to one ratio and whatnot. But it's a variable scale, but we'll be following the city code on that and looking for opportunities to save trees wherever we can. Thank you. Can property owners just say no to trails that encroach on their property? Do they have that option? Trish, do you want to answer this one? Surely. Uh, so certainly people can say no, uh, but there is also a process as that the city has identified this as, a, as an essential project. And the city does have the ability to uh, utilize a process where we uh, acquire the property um, uh, in a fair manner um, and uh, without the, the property owner ultimately has to approve it, but the city does have the right to purchase it. Uh, and so adjacent property owners can't really completely stop the project, but certainly our desire is to come up with a solution that is agreeable for the property owners and come up with a, a compensation package and a final uh, process that they uh, are satisfied with. Thank you. So I'm going to jump back to the question just before that one. We had a follow-up question related to that, and it's, it's this. The Church of Christ rarely uses the north driveway, and this is already an easement for the cell phone tower. Why not use this north driveway for the bicycle access to the bridge? Aaron, I'm going to let you speak to that one, but there are some challenges uh, with that easement. But Aaron, I'll, I'll let you elaborate on that one. Sure. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of reasons why we did consider an alignment that used that north driveway and then made the connection to the bridge. Um, but there's a few challenges. One is, is the easement itself. That's a private easement that the cell phone tower operators have on the Church of Christ parcel. And that would be, uh, could be costly to renegotiate and relocate that easement. Um, two, it's a much longer route. Um, for bicycle and pedestrian users to make that connection along the north edge of the property and then down to the bridge location. Um, and we, after discussions with the church, they were concerned about cut through, people just basically cutting through their lot to make the connection. And they had requested a fence between their property and any trail. And that would mean that the trail would have a fence on both sides, uh, which presents safety concerns. You know, um, uh, trails are often feel most safe when people feel like they have a place to get away from an incident. And if you have a fence on both sides of the trail, that safety can be compromised. Um, additionally, as Lee mentioned, Thornton Creek is uh, uh, daylights in that area or goes above ground in that area. Um, and there are some environmental concerns with that building a trail in and around that creek. All right, thank you. Someone asked, will parking be permitted at Twin Ponds for bridge users? Uh, Trish or Natasha, you care to answer this one? So I would say that, and Trish, correct me if you think differently, that um, we would not be having parking for users um, of the bridge. It would be for the park and our parks department would be, we'd be working with for enforcement of that, figure out a program to ensure that there's still parking access to the parks and it's not used up by folks parking and getting on light rail. And I would agree with that in, in that um, you know, our sort of target audience for this bridge use are people that can get to the bridge uh, on foot or on bike. Um, versus driving cars and parking in this area. If people want to park to access the light rail, that is the intent of the garage over at the light rail station. Okay, thank you. 
We've had a few questions about First Avenue Northeast. Specifically, will First Avenue Northeast be impacted? Right now it is quite narrow. Is the city addressing increased usage? Rish, do you want to answer this one? Sure. Uh, there is a separate project for First Avenue Northeast, as uh, Lee mentioned earlier, to install sidewalks. Um, and we have not begun that design yet on that project. Um, and as part of that, we will be looking at what are the uses. But again, our goal is to create a pedestrian, uh, bicycle-oriented feel along first, rather than making it a um, increasing traffic or a large traffic thoroughfare. Uh, so we will be taking uh, precautions when we do look at First Avenue uh, and this bridge landing at First Avenue uh, to make sure we're protecting bikes and pets and uh, making sure cars are moving slowly and safely. Thanks. So we've had a few questions about how pedestrians and cyclists come together on the east and the west side to go over the bridge um, and if bicyclists will use stairs. So I'm gonna read the first one. On the west side trail in option one, where would the pedestrians and cyclists join together to get over the bridge? So they would join together immediately to the east of the existing parking lot, right at that confluence point, just to the west of the bridge landing. And Aaron, feel free to jump in if I get any of the details wrong, but that's the current, um, for option one, that's the current confluence point. Yep, that's correct, Lee. And to clarify, would there be stairs on that side? All, none of the west side alternatives have stairs currently in their design. Okay, yeah, seems like there was potentially some confusion. A follow-up question, it appears that through bike, through bike users, um, bike users that are using the bridge to cross I-5 locally would have to navigate stairs in some of the options on the east side, is that correct? No, that's not correct. Some of the options on the east side have stairs as a secondary route, but the, the primary route will be ramped uh, all the way from the bridge landing down to the light rail station. There, there won't ever be a point where someone's going to have to get off of their bike and go upstairs. The stairs will be there for pedestrians to use as a secondary route in some of those alternatives. Great. We, we have a few minutes left. Um, we have time for one more question uh, and then we'll transition to some closing comments. The last question being, what are your plans for artist invo involvement? Trish, do you wanna answer this one? Sure. Um, that is something we need to work on here in the next phase as we move from this sort of beginning preferred alternative and then as we move towards 30 percent is to see where and what are the opportunities uh, to incorporate art into the project or near the project. Uh, the, the city does have a uh, uh, arts program and we will need to work that's managed through our Parks and Cultural Resources Department, and we will need to work with them uh, on, on uh, the primary alternatives to incorporate art. We just haven't made it to that decision yet. All right, thank you. Lee? Okay, so that brings us to the end of our Q&A session. Um, thank you for your participation today. If we didn't get to your question, uh, we will have all of the questions and answers posted um, to the project website next week. The online open house will be open through May 1st. I invite you, if you haven't already done so, please visit the site and give further feedback um, on that site. And it allows you to um, also take a look at uh, each of these alternatives uh, in a little bit more depth. And we'd appreciate you sharing the information about the online open house and survey with others who you think might be interested. Um, we'll also plan to post a recording of this webinar and the question and answer session, along with a summary of the webinar, um, including answers to any questions that weren't answered to the project website within the next week or so. And uh, you can see links on the screen to both the online open house and to the project website uh, for further access. And again, thank you for your time and um, 
appreciate your time and have a wonderful day.